time received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who had passed from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Okay, so a very common... uh, story that we have, and uh, what are some of your first impressions? I don't want a long treatise of what you think on this, just what are some very short impressions and lessons that we can learn from this particular story? Okay, don't be afraid. (laughs) I won't cut you off if I think it's too long. Okay, there is a point in time that it is too late. You have to make a decision. So, very good. Any other thing that we see here from this story? Okay. Uh, I am old enough to remember this, and many of you are not, but when I was, for a while, there was a real impetus among Christian creationists to find the ark. There were all kinds of, uh, of uh, journeys that they were making, and they were going back to Turkey, to Mount Ararat, and there were all of these pictures that people had taken of the ark and so on. The amazing thing about all of these pictures was that they always got destroyed or were burned or something like that just before someone was able to authenticate them. But the reason that they had such a push to find the ark was, why? If you found the ark, there'd be this massive uh, movement toward Christianity. And everybody would say, yes, the Bible is true, everything in there, we have to go there. I was able to say, you know, I I thought it would have been kind of cool to go and find the ark too, although I wasn't real anxious to be shot at by the Kurds because the Kurdish people who uh, rule the area around uh, Mount Ararat weren't all that excited about... uh, people coming there and exploring that. So anyway, I thought, but again, I did not think that this would be a massive evangelistic tool. And this is what um, the story is telling us here, that if they don't believe what you've got here, and they just had the prophets, they just had the Old Testament at that time, if you don't believe that, they won't believe somebody coming back from the dead. Any other things that we see from this? Yes, Grant. So his, his depiction of the, of the poor man there, Lazarus, uh, would have been a depiction of the uh, spiritually abused as a man who was in sin or been born in sin or family from sin. And because of that, he's being punished by God. Okay. All okay, we have the kind of the uh, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel looking at the opposite side of this. Now, we don't know whether this is a parable or whether this is a real story. And why is this a, why do people question whether this is a parable or not? Doug? Because it names uh, the individual Lazarus. Okay. 
All right. So we don't know whether this what could this could be a parable, and Jesus just gave a name to the individual, the poor man, but uh, we don't know that. Now, why would, if it is a parable, what might be one reason why Jesus would have given a name to the poor man? Pardon? Okay, Lazarus' friend. What might be another possible reason for this? Why could... Yes, Gina. Maybe they could identify better with the person who's dying. Okay, they might be able to identify better with a person with a name. At this point, he had already raised Lazarus from the dead. So that could have been a reason to use his name in saying it can happen. Okay, all right. So this was not the same Lazarus as Mary and Martha's brother but we have, have the name there. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking of is maybe just to give the importance that Jesus places on the individual who lived for God, did not have any of this world's amenities. Uh, it says that the dogs licked his sores. Why is that, uh, look, why is that considered to be way on the bottom there. Yes? Okay. Okay. Okay, all right. So that the name Lazarus means that God is a helper. And so Jesus was looking down on this individual, even though, and he mentions here in the story, uh, you want to call it a parable or not, but that this rich man, he had all of the good things in life while he was alive, and now he was in Hades. Yes, Ben. Right. The dog is not a favored pet in the Old Testament uh, or even in, in biblical times. The dog was considered to be looked down on. This was, they were curs. They were not family pets. And so the dog licking uh, the wounds would be something that would be pretty awful. We see here that this rich man is in Hades. Uh, Hades was the place of the wicked before the final judgment, and the final judgment will be coming in the future yet, but Hades is the place of the wicked. And uh, Abraham, or the, the rich man was there. He was uh, uh, not able to get out of there. So we see, though, that he did show some compassion. And the compassion that he had was for his brothers now. He wanted somebody to go and warn his brothers. But Jesus mentioned that, you know, if they wouldn't obey the prophets, uh, they would not uh, obey somebody coming back uh, from the dead. Um, and I think the couple of things from this parable. One is that there is a definite time, there is an end. And the decision has to be made while you're able to make this decision. And then you have the aspect of the, uh, that uh, you, you can't have somebody 
go back and bring in extra biblical information that is going to convince somebody that they should uh, be saved. Uh, the Spirit has to uh, guide, the, the Spirit has to um, direct the individual, and you get this from reading the Bible and reading what we have here. Okay, any other comments or questions before we go on to chapter 17? Yes, Ben. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. You're right. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Right, yes. Uh-huh. Okay, right, and uh, what Eric is saying for those of you who are in the back, and that is that the soldiers that were at the cross, at the crucifixion, when Jesus rose from the dead and they heard this, that Jesus had risen from the dead, was there a mass uh, repentance by these soldiers, uh, and did they all go and accept Jesus at this time? The, the, right, okay. 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 Uh huh. Right. Yes. And so the Jewish leadership did not repent, and so we see what Jesus is saying here is a prophecy of that of that fact that somebody coming back from the dead is not going to uh, convince them. Yes, Flora. <laughs> oh yes, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, right. Okay. All right. Grant. One of the applications I want to get out of this for my own life is one of the things Ben said, and uh, everybody else has said, and Dave said up there, and that is, as Christians, um, we kind of talk like this about, okay, we're not going to get saved until we're found, we're right, we're right, we're right, we're right, we're right, we're right, we know that in Scripture, but the reality is, Okay. And, you know, I, I keep, one of the haunting verses that I've always held that in, in the Bible is where it says when the, the Lord comes back, he'll be found safe on the earth. And, uh, you know, I think a part of that in the life of Christians is we don't have the faith to give forth the word of God or the gospel in its simple form, either because we're afraid of retribution on 
than we would do, or we're afraid of the effects of that, and, and we'll feel like failures, whatever it might be. But this, this is, to me, this parallel could be a help to us to be like, we need to give the gospel for it, and the results of it are not in our hands. Right. Uh, it's, it's, we, we don't know what Lazarus told to the rich man. It's possible that Lazarus witnessed to the rich man when he was there uh, at the gate and uh, so on. But uh, we, we are not responsible for the results. John, you had a comment you were going to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, chapter 17. We have four stories here that kind of uh, are made for discipleship or focused on discipleship. Now, as I was <clears throat> going through this again, and I was thinking, you have to keep thinking about this, and this is that Luke wrote this somewhere about 60 A.D., so this was some 30 years after Jesus had uh, died, rose, and went to heaven. He wrote this to Theophilus. So he was writing this to a Gentile crowd, but he was talking about what Jesus said to the Jews and to some of his disciples. And so we have a fairly complex uh, situation here that we have to kind of keep in mind. And so uh, Luke is telling Theophilus and all of the rest of the readers, including us, uh, what Jesus said to the disciples, to the apostles, to the Pharisees and the leaders and so on, and we have to apply this to our life, the same thing as Theophilus had to apply it to his life. Chapter 17, and he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day, turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. All right, we see now he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the followers uh, of, uh, of Jesus. And he says that temptations are going to come. Anybody here who has not had a temptation come? Um, <clears throat> then that's not biblical. Temptations are going to come, and we have to respond with God's word to those temptations. And so he's saying here that there are going to be temptations that are coming. And if you allow these temptations to now, for you to now put this on someone else and cause someone else to sin, that is that they would have rather have a millstone hung around your neck. Okay, now why didn't that open? I had everything all set up, and it has a, <clears throat> okay, it's going to take a little bit for it to, so anyway, there are several kinds of millstones. One of the millstones, and this one that eventually will show up, is a small millstone. It had a cavity in the middle. You would pour your grain in there, and then you would take a mallet of some type, and you would now grind your uh, grain by hand. And so this could be, and you know, I don't know how much that millstone would weigh, but it was probably 5, 10 pounds, and if you weren't a very good swimmer, that might be enough to take you down. Or we have another type of millstone, this is the big millstone that was run either by an oxen or a donkey. And they would put grain into that cavity there, and then the donkey would go on around and around, and that would just roll and uh, crush the grain. And so we're not sure which millstone Jesus was talking about there, 
but either one of these would be enough to cause someone to drown. And so it says that if you cause someone else to sin, this is a serious situation for your life. Then also it says that if your brother sins, you are supposed to try and in love uh, make him aware of this and see if he can correct his ways. And if they sin against you, it says that you are supposed to sin or you're supposed to repent seven times. So you're supposed to have a little pad, all right, and a pencil, and then every time your brother sins, you're supposed to mark this, and on the seventh one after that, okay, that's it, you've had it. No. This just means don't count, all right? Don't count. And you, by refusing to forgive someone, you are now sinning. And so we see this uh, story or this uh, that he's talking to his disciples. You are going to face temptations. There are going to be temptations coming to your life, and uh, you need to handle these in this particular way. Then the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now Jesus uses this illustration at least one other time, but there he asked them to move a mountain, or said you could move a mountain if you had a faith as a mustard seed. The mustard seed is a very small seed. It's the smallest of the seeds of the grains that are grown in Israel. And so, again, he's talking about the, this uh, thing that we have, that they didn't have enough faith. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. One is you could ask for more faith, increase the faith, or you could use the faith that you have and use the faith to trust in Christ and let him work in the life. Um, I, I think from this little, just a couple of verses that Luke has given us here, we have the admonition that we are supposed to continue with our faith. We're supposed to keep faith in Jesus and that we are supposed to allow this to work in our lives. Then we go on to the next one. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will, you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, saying, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty. Okay, what is the general uh, lesson that you can get from this little story? Okay, Jesus is saying that... Uh, when you're servant, and so this would have been a bond servant. This was one of the household, could have been somebody that was taking care of the household or taking care of the livestock, the farming, and so on. When this individual comes on in, what is their responsibility? Continue to serve. Yes, Sue? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Continue to serve. All, so that we have this, you, you don't have this individual coming on in and now taking the place of honor immediately after all of the responsibilities have been taken care of. Then we can have the time of of uh, communion, the time of visiting, etc., 
so on, but that this individual is supposed to continue to serve. Now, what is the lesson that Jesus is trying to get across to the audience that he is speaking to? Grant. Okay, whenever you get a paycheck from your uh, employer, those of you that are still gainfully employed or employed otherwise, uh, <laughs> do you expect along with this check to have glowing reports of what you have done and how great you have performed your duties? No, that's what you get paid for, to do your duties and so on. And so this is what... But now, how is Jesus applying this to the people that he's talking to? Okay, who are the people that he was talking to? The disciples. And in the disciples, we also had the Pharisees were there. There were some of the Pharisees that were there. But the disciples were expected to carry out their responsibility. Now, the Pharisees, what did the Pharisees like to have done? They liked praise, all right? They wanted to have the praise of man for doing the things that they were supposed to do, which was lead the people in their worship. Doug. Right. Okay. All right. It's kind of like the government that needs more money to solve all of the problems. All right. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes, you've all had days at work uh, that were kind of like that. And uh, so anyway, we see this. And then the aspect of Jesus continuing on with, you know, do the work that you're supposed to do and you aren't expected to be given a lot of, uh, of uh, extra praise for that. So the normal responsibility of a servant needs no commendation. Okay, now we go on and it says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along Samaria and Galilee. We'll just review a little bit on the... Okay, we have... <clears throat> Yeah, here we go. Okay, remember that Jesus, uh, okay, we have Capernaum, which is kind of his base up in Galilee. We have Jerusalem down here, which is a base down in Judea. He had been in the Jericho area or the Jerusalem area, and the Pharisees told him to leave, and so he went on over to Perea. So he was in Perea, and then we see that he headed back up to, uh, to Canaan, and uh, he was up here in uh, Gal the area of Galilee. And now it says that he was on his way to Jerusalem. And I we're not sure just exactly where this is, but it says that he was in the border of Samaria and, and uh, Judea. And so he's on his way to Jerusalem now. And so whether he went here and then to Perea, ministered there, went back up to Capernaum, and is now back on his way down uh, which is for the Passover and for the crucifixion and so on. But he's probably in this area someplace. So it says that 
On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And they went, and they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the mine? nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Okay, we have a couple of things here. One is the lepers were together. They were outside of the village. Now, leprosy was a disease that could be, could be spread, easily spread, and somebody that had leprosy was now uh, ostracized, and they had to stay outside the village, and so they would usually gather together. But we have just a little bit of an unusual situation with this grouping of ten lepers, and what is that grouping? What is that thing that's a little different? Uh, Gordy. Okay, one of them was a Samaritan. And so now you've got this. The Samaritans did not mingle with the Jews. But since they all had leprosy, they, did, they, they forgot about the fact that he was a Samaritan. And so there was not the segregation between the Samaritans and the Jews here because they had the leprosy. And so they were together. And we see then that uh, they came, all ten were healed by Jesus, and they presented themselves to the priest, which was part of the law that if you were healed of leprosy, you could go to the priest. The priest would then tell you or give you some uh, notification that you were able to now enter back into the normal uh, life of the community. So you could go back into the village. And we see that the Samaritan was the one that came to thank Jesus. And I think it's interesting that we go through pretty much the whole story, and then Luke puts in there, now he was a Samaritan, the one that thanked Jesus. So what is one of the things that we can see from that particular aspect? Yes, John. Okay. Okay, so we see that, uh, Pastor, did you? Okay, all right. Okay, so you have the gospel being spread out to others than the Jews and them accepting this. And so, uh, again, we're seeing Jesus giving this story to his disciples remembering that this is also being sent to Theophilus and so that he is able to understand that the, the word that uh, Luke is giving out is not just for the Jews, but that it's going out to uh, all individuals. Then we see, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Now will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So Jesus is now focusing on the Pharisees, and they said the, the Pharisees are looking for the kingdom of God. Now what, was the, what were they looking for? And we don't have Randy here to tell us this. 
They were looking for the kingdom on the earth, all right? They, and the Pharisees were really looking for this. So they were looking for that, and Jesus is telling them, hey, it's here. The kingdom is here. What does Jesus mean by this? Yes? Okay, salvation, all right. Expand on this just a bit. I am the kingdom. I am here. You need to follow me, all right? You follow Jesus, and this is the kingdom. And the Pharisees were not looking to follow Jesus. They were looking to follow the Torah and their interpretation of the Torah. So we see that Christ says that he is the kingdom. Then in verse 22, and he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will de desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here, do not go out or follow them, for as the lightning flashes and the lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them. Uh, likewise, just as they were in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. There's a very interesting little thing that I had not picked up on until one of my commentaries brought this up. What is missing in the talking about Lot and Sodom that was mentioned in Noah's day? What was not taking place in Sodom? Yes, they weren't getting married. And so we had a situation that's probably very common to things that are happening in the world today and in the United States today, is that they were not getting married. And so we have this difference. Then it said, <clears throat> so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not take down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding in together, one will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, where there the vultures will gather. Now, those of you that have a KJV version, have another verse in there. There's a verse 36 in the ESV and the NIV and several others. Verse 36 is missing. And the reason is because that doesn't seem to be in the oldest manuscripts that the, uh, that the translations were taken from. And the verse that's missing is that two would be in the field, one would be taken and the other left. It doesn't change the story. It doesn't change the meaning of this at all. But so we see that Jesus is giving this illustration now uh, of this. We are not going to be discussing pre-trib, post-trib, um, um, you know, amil, and so on with this particular story. We not the purpose is not for that. What is the purpose of this story? I think we've already touched on it. Nick, you want to add to this? You gave it before. Oh, there's a time when it's going to be too late. And so there is going to be a time and regardless of what your eschatology is as to when this end time is going to be, there Ill will be an end time. And so we see that the, uh, uh, the uh, 
Jesus is mentioning this, and a couple of things. One is that this end time can't be planned for. Uh, as we, it says, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days and you will not see it. So you can't plan for it. So this goes against the individuals that have come up with the dating systems as to when the uh, rapture is going to take place. And uh, I don't, I haven't checked on this as to how many there have been, but there have been numerous times, even in not the too distant past where individuals uh, were setting up times when this is going to, Jesus says you can't do this. All right, so you can plan for it. But it is coming. There will be a time. And when it does come, it's going to be sudden. You can't go back and get your photos before you, you know, escape. You can't take your photos out of the house as it's burning. Uh, so you're, you're, you're not going to have time for that type of thing. So it's going to take place. It will take place suddenly. Uh, it will separate families. And so individuals where there has not been a... Uh, just because your parents were saved doesn't mean that you will be. Just because you have a brother or a sister that is saved doesn't mean that you will be. Uh, families are going to be separated. Then the last verse there, and they said to him, Where, Lord, he said, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Kind of an interesting little end to this story. Any ideas about what this end applies to? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I. I yeah. All right. We're going there. Uh, yes, Eric. Okay. All right. Okay. You're right. Okay. Okay. You see this a lot in the Florida Everglades where you'll see vultures circling and uh, you stop and you can smell it before you can see it. Uh, carcass of some gator or something that's, that's there. So, yeah, where you, there's evidence there. Doug, you had some. I was just thinking that if it's in the ask where, it's going to take place wherever there are people that this event pertains to. Okay. All right. So wherever there are saved people, there are individuals that are going to be taken here. And so, and so this means that people are going to, they're going to know that something has taken place. People that are not part of the resurrection they will know. They're not going to wonder, well, I want what happened to that individual and so on. They'll know that, uh, that something uh, great has taken place. Flora. Okay, now we're getting into the situation of where you're a mill, a post mill, so on, and we're not really going to go that place today, but uh, they will continue to live. This earth will, I believe, will still be around for some time. Yes. Okay. Okay. The reason why I thought that that's the question is because that story that we read about Lazarus okay. is really an interesting story. And Jesus gives details where there's no, no found nowhere else in the Bible. 
Okay, all right. And so the Hades is a Greek word, and it, it's Greek mythological terror in our understanding. Uh huh. And Zeus is Uranus in Greek, a story that Jesus told. When Jesus uses that word, he's not thinking Hades, because Jesus was not Greek. Okay. All right. What Jesus means when he says that is still. Okay. This is the Hebrew word that means the place of the dead. Okay. Or the place that the dead go to after death. And so and they are separated. So we so have in this story what we find out is that that waiting place at the end right. of the final judgment has a part of it that is painful and and and, and suffering. Mm-hmm. Right. But they're both, they're, it's a resting place. Yeah. There's a divider in between, there's no crossing. Okay. So what I think, this is still in context with the story of when they're all relatively standing on their own, I think that the, the disciples have picked up on this new thing that Jesus is teaching. And that's why they're asking. So that's what happened in this two story paper. But where do they go? All right. Okay. Yes, and uh, I no place that I researched did I see that, and so you may need to add that to a commentary. <laughs> I think that, that that's a very good thought uh, on there. This so is, this is the reason why not having a, a good legal understanding of the Old Testament gets the commentators messed up. Okay. Okay, so they need to read Dennis Prager's commentary on the Old Testament then. Uh, Jason is getting very nervous back there, pointing to the clock, so we, we will dismiss you at this time. So we'll start with chapter 18 next time.